Okay, Jay. So this lecture is about uh, the philosophy of management research. Uh, it's going to be a two-part lecture. So in this one, I'm going to explore with you the different types of philosophies that exist and what are some of the consequences that they could have upon us conducting management research, right? So I, I brought forward here some uh, notes and I'll share these with you on your um, Google Classroom, so you can have a look at them as well. Uh, but management philosophy or the philosophy of management research is important to understand because it helps us to think through the philosophical concerns that exist and doing so is going to lead us to improve the quality of the research study that we are planning to conduct, right? So specifically, um, why the question arises that why do we need to understand uh, research philosophy uh, by itself? So number one, it leads to a better quality of research, but how does it do that? Well, one, it helps you to understand your own reflexive role in the research study. It allows you to understand what influence that you may have within the research study and how your presence or the lack thereof is going to affect that research study, right? So you have to understand the philosophical debate behind uh, yourself and your presence in the research study. And by understanding research philosophy or sort of understanding your own reflexive nature in the research process, right? Number two, um, it helps to clarify the research design, right? So specifically, you may have certain research questions for which you're going into the field to collect data and then interpret that data and so on and so forth. So the, the research design becomes clearer when you have understood this research philosophy that exists so that you can better understand how that research design is going to influence what type of data you can gather, what type of research questions you can answer, and how that data once it is gathered can be interpreted. The third thing that research philosophy does for you is, is that it helps you to design, sorry, to understand and recognize which type of research designs exist so that you can uh, think more clearly about which type of research design will work in your case. Uh, depends on, completely upon the research questions that you're asking. But if you don't understand the basic types of research designs that exist and the philosophies that exist behind them, then on what basis are you going to make the choice as to which design to sort of follow and which one not to follow, right? So by understanding research philosophy to some extent, you are able to uh, debate amongst these different types of uh, designs and uh, select a design that sort of works uh, better for your own study. And the fourth uh, thing that we achieve by understanding research philosophy is that we can have a look at um, existing designs, research designs that exist, and then we can adapt them to our own study. Or we may have a study which requires a completely new research design so we can then come up with a uh, all encompassing holistic type of design that will achieve uh, the types of research questions that we have posed, right? So it's a very powerful tool in that sense that it helps you uh, to not only improve your own work, but also to think about other people's work as well. Uh, and then you can pass judgments about research uh, methodologies and the choice of those methodologies that those other researchers have uh, taken up. Right? Now, there's a lot of debate that goes on in, in, in philosophy, specifically about different types of philosophical stances that are possible. And the most common thing that these philosophical debates do is that they denigrate other people's point of views. So rather than us doing the same thing, what I propose we do in this lecture is to sort of understand the perspective of all these different types of uh, philosophical approaches that are possible so that we can get both the perspectives uh, from, from both point of views, we can understand this, um, and then we can make our own decision about which philosophical stance that would be, uh, that would work for us and uh, make our own choices. 
that way, right? But before we do that, we need to understand some terms, and these are four terms that are going to, you will encounter them in, in a lot of your readings, et cetera. So it would be nice to have some basic level of understanding of these. Uh, the first term is the word ontology, right? Uh, it used to be a word of philosophy, but now lately it has become a word of science. So ontology is something that you cannot escape as a social scientist. Uh, you have to understand what it is. So what is an ontology? It is uh, basically a view about the nature of reality and its existence, right? So the question that ontology uh, is seeking to answer is, what is the nature of reality and in what shape and form does it exist? Right? That is then followed by something called an epistemology. Epistemology, uh, very briefly, is a theory of knowledge and it helps us to understand the best ways of inquiring into the nature of the world. Right? So first we have to have an ontological viewpoint. And once we have a particular ontological viewpoint, then the next question is, well, what can we know about that uh, type of the world that we have envisioned or the, the nature of reality that we have envisioned? Um, basically, as sort of helping us to decipher what would be relevant questions that our uh, research study can ask. Right? Then is the word methodology, right? It is a combination of techniques that are used to inquire into specific situations, right? So uh, the different types of methodologies that exist all have their own ontological and epistemological groundings. And these are a complete set of techniques that can be used to inquire into specific situations, right? And you have already encountered the names of some of these methodologies methodologies such as experiment, such as the survey methodology, the grounded theory, action research, um, ethno methodology, ethnography, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of different methodologies that exist out there. And the fourth term that we encounter is something called a method. So methods are basically the tools and techniques that you use within the methodology that you have adopted in order to not even collect data, but also to analyze data and to make uh, your uh, data presentations and so forth, right? Now, there's different types of methodologies that can be used uh, in the natural sciences, and there's different types of methodologies that are in more prevalent uh, use in the social sciences, um, but we have to, um, sort of uh, understand at this particular point in time that the natural sciences have a completely different ontological and epistemological grounding as opposed to the social sciences, right? So uh, that's what, uh, th these are some of the basic uh, terminologies that we'll be keeping in our mind. And these basically shape all the research philosophies that we have specifically the ontological and epistemological perspectives and point of views that we have, right? Now, the relationship um, amongst an ontology, epistemology, methodology, and method uh, can be envisioned in the form of a metaphor of a tree. And if you think about a tree that has been cut down and, and you're looking at the stump of the tree, um, so the innermost circle is the ontology, then the outer circle around that is the epistemology, then the circle surrounding that is the methodology, and the outermost uh, circle that we'll have is what we call as the methods, right? So the metaphor of a tree is a good way of sort of thinking about the relationship that exists among these words. Now, there's different types of research philosophies that exist, uh, and there's a lot of debate that sort of goes on between this idea of realism versus relativism. So I think that would be a good starting point, right? So realism uh, is basically this philosophy that, that seeks to answer this question of what the real is and how is it, right? Um, basically, uh, in, in very loose terms, we can say that realism has two uh, essential components. One is what we call as existence and the other is what we call as independence, right? For example, uh, a realist would say, well, the moon exists. Right? And is there any de denying of whether the moon is there or not? We all see it most of the evenings when we go outside, the moon is out there in various shapes. 
uh, but it does exist and it has existed for a very long time and it probably will exist for uh, much, much, much longer, right? So the moon exists. Now, it has independence, right? It has a particular nature, it has a particular structure and it does certain things. Whether you are looking at it or not looking at it, whether you believe in it uh, or not, that is regardless. Right, so the, the idea of realism is that things are real, they exist, and they exercise some powers, right? And these powers are independent of whether you are there or not there, whether you believe in them or not believe in them. The real is, is the ultimate, it, it sort of exists, right? So one quest is to find the real and to find the, uh, the independence of that particular object or uh, phenomena that exists, right? Now, the other philosophy that we have is the opposing end of the spectrum is called relativism, right? Relativism says, well, things do exist, but they are relative, right? Relative to who it is that's looking at it and from what perspective they are looking at that particular object or phenomena. For example, justice. It's an it's important topic that we do encounter, but it is a relative. Uh, justice is relative to the local norms that you believe in and adhere to. For example, you may belong to a culture where you may believe in something called an eye for an eye. So if somebody commits murder, justice for you would entail that that person be executed. But then there's other societies which have ceased to believe in this idea of an eye to an eye, eye for an eye, and there a murderer is not going to be executed, rather they will be placed in um, some sort of a jail and they'll be incarcerated for a, a period of time. So from one culture's perspective, it may not be uh, that justice has been served, but from another cultural perspective, it means that justice has been served, right? So that is the idea of relativism that uh, things are relative, right? Similarly, truth is also uh, relative to the language and the use of the words that are um, exercised in order to explain something to be um, of, of truth or not, right? So there's a lot of relativism that exists as well. Then the third philosophy that we have uh, is, is sort of an extension of uh, realism. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a drastic change in uh, uh, realism as well. And this is called transcendental realism, right? And this was proposed by somebody by the name of Roy Ram Bhaskar. And uh, just an interesting side note for you, Bhaskar belonged to the present day Gujarat within Pakistan. His father then migrated to the United Kingdom. Uh, his mother was uh, a white British lady. Uh, he's, he was an Oxford fellow uh, and he made a significant contribution to, uh, to this idea of transcendental realism. Um, and, and he passed away, uh, I think around 2008 or something, right? So what Bhaskar does is that he divides the reality into three components. One, he says the, uh, it is the real, the second component of reality is the actual, and the third component of reality is the empirical, right? So what happens in the real? Um, it is the intransitive domain, intransitive meaning that it doesn't change, right? So the real is the objects uh, that exist, the structures that these objects have, and the powers that these objects exercise in nature, right? So that, that's something that exists. So for example, we can say that the moon is real, right? Uh, it is an object, it has a structure, and it exercises certain powers in the universe, right? Uh, as an example, we know that all uh, the waves in the ocean uh, occur because of the distance the moon has at that particular time away from the earth or its nearness to the earth. So that causes these, a variety of, of uh, uh, waves in the ocean to exist, right? So it has a structure, it is an object, and it exercises certain causes. Now the actual is even though that, you know, these objects exist and they have structures and they have uh, causal powers, we often see that these 
objects, their structures, and their causal powers go unrealized. You know, many people live their life without ever, in, you know, having gone to a beach, without ever having seen an ocean, uh, and they they seldom think about what the moon is doing on the surface of the earth, right? So that is the, the actual, right? Uh, which says that events actually occur regardless of whether we are aware of them, right? Regardless of whether we are seeing these things, right? So the real is out there, the structure is out there, and the, the causal powers are there. And these causal powers are causing different things upon our planet in case of the moon, uh, whether we realize them or not, right? So that is the actual power of the moon on, on, on our planet, right? But the third item is more interesting, which is the empirical, which is the events that we actually do encounter. So if, for example, I go to a beach one day, I see that the sea is far away, uh, from the beach, but later on in the evening, the sea gets closer and closer, and high tide comes, right? And most of the beach that was uh, dry at that time gets covered in a, in a big body of water. So I've actually now experienced the causal power of the moon, right? So we have to, uh, in, in transcendental realism, understand that the, the real is there, the actual is there, but what we are more concerned about is the empirical, what it is that we actually get to experience, right? So this is another philosophical view about reality. Then comes in this other view of reality, uh, and again, it's a form of realism, and that's called internal realism, right? Internal realism believes in a single reality, reality. Uh, it believes in a single reality, but it asserts that it is never possible to access that single reality directly. Right? Now, that's, that's a very kooky thing, that we are believing that there's a single reality, but we're saying that we cannot directly access that reality. Rather, we have to use other uh, tools or other methods to somehow come closer to this. So I'll, I'll provide you an example of this. The example is something called a bubble chamber, right? This is something that was developed in the 1950s. Uh, it was this big chamber that was uh, filled with supercharged hydrogen uh, liquid, right? Uh, or gas, so to speak. And then um, these, these high energy particles floating around in the universe would come into this chamber. And as they would move through this chamber, uh, the, the liquid would become uh, boiled up because now extra energy has come into this chamber. Uh, and then we could see the path of that particular particle. Right. So this allowed us to, for example, have a look at the path of a proton or maybe a, of an atom or something as it was moving through this liquid. But then comes in Heisenberg, where there's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and he says, well, uh, hold on, uh, you can either get very close to understanding the momentum of this particle, or you can uh, understand the position of that. So if you understand the position more perfectly, the lesser you will understand the momentum it had at that particular instance or vice versa. So either you could understand the momentum or you could understand the particular position, but you could not understand both perfectly. Right? So that's what we mean by the single reality and our lack of access to that reality directly. So we're taking indirect ways, uh, but we're sort of either understanding the momentum of it or understanding the position of it in that way. Uh, we're saying that we cannot understand reality perfectly and completely, rather we have to uh, try again and again in, in various ways. Right? Um, an internal realist would argue that scientific laws, once uh, they have been discovered, uh, become absolute. Right? And they are now independent of further observation. Right? So internal realism is important in that sense because it's sort of saying to us that once you have found a scientific law, it does not make sense to redo those experiments again and again. You know, for example, in the social sciences, we find that we conducted some research study in Pakistan and we found some 
answers and you say, well, here's what, what we have found, right? But then somebody else would come in and says, well, that was only specific to this country, so I'm going to retry this in some other country and see whether it holds true and so on and so forth, right? But an internal realist or an internal realist philosophy is saying that, no, that's not the case. Once you have discovered a scientific law, uh, and it, it becomes absolute and it becomes independent. You don't have to redo that experiment again and again. So we find, for example, Galileo's um, uh, experiments, uh, there, there was no need to redo them. Uh, the Newton's experiments weren't done and uh, once completed in the United Kingdom had uh, no need to be retested elsewhere in the world, right? So it sort of gives, uh, gives us this the sense that once uh, we have found something, we're done with it, and we don't have to go about checking it again and again and rediscovering it, right? Then what would the relativists say? The relativists would argue that scientific laws are not simply out there to be uh, discovered, rather they are created by people. Right? That, that's another strange thought, that scientific laws are created by people, they are they are discovered and they're created by people. What do we mean by that? Well, an interesting study took pl place in 1979 by Latour and Wolgar. In that, what they found was that they were looking at basically research groups and uh, different types of laboratories where scientists found different patterns within uh, the data that they were observing. And then they, they sat down and they went through this series of discussions and debates on, on how to interpret and bring some sense into that interpretation and, and come up with some sort of a, a theory or a name for that, right? So there was this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, motion of, of creation taking place, right? So this is what relativism is sort of um, uh, talking about when it says that uh, these these phenomena are discovered, right? Uh, uh, they they simply don't have to be discovered only, but they have to be created, right? There's this, this human uh, discussion that takes place in order to make some sense of it, and then provide some name to it, and and come up with an agreement about it, and so forth. Right? Now, different people will be coming up with different explanations. Uh, different labs and people working there would be coming up with different explanations and names for these. So which one do we accept? Well, it all depends then upon basically the status that that researcher holds in society and that reputation that they have and those people that are holding a higher status or have a bigger reputation, those ideas would be accepted more prevalently as opposed to other ideas, right? So here, uh, we can think about, um, you know, there's recently this uh, Higgs boson and the God particle idea that, that sort of was, uh, you know, uh, reaffirmed to have existed recently. Uh, it's, it wasn't a new idea. It was an idea that uh, Dr. Higgs had been talking about since the 1970s, but because he didn't have a lot of status and reputation, people were laughing at his idea and denigrating him and so forth, but eventually the experiments proved that his thought was correct and suddenly he became all important, right? And that idea got again more acceptance. So this is uh, what what uh, relativists are talking about, right? Uh, now, Nor Satina in 1983 concurred uh, with the same, same thought and they say that the acceptance of a theory or a closure of a scientific debate uh, within management literature per se is influenced by the policies of business and commercial resources, right? So there, there's a lot of human influence in here, so to speak, right? Um, you can take an example of the, uh, the climate change that's taking place around us uh, and there, there's not a single agreement as to whether uh, you know, climate change is there or not there. Some people are accepting it, some are rejecting it, they're providing evidences that it exists, and, you know, the politicians are disagreeing with it, and then different photographs are, you know, put up in front of us and say, well, oh, no, you know, uh, the ice has actually increased rather than decreased, look at this glacier and so forth, right? So who's going to win uh, is basically going to be that, uh, that, community which holds more status and which holds uh, higher reputation in, in, in the grand scheme of things. 
right? So that's the uh, relativist transfer. Right? Now, the realists like to take a stab at the relativist, right? So for example, there's a very famous realist by the name of uh, Richard Dawkins. He's a evolutionary biologist. And he states that uh, the most dedicated relativist does not believe when flying at 40,000 feet in a Boeing 747 that the laws of physics that hold the jet in the air are mere constructs of the imagination, right? So he's sort of laughing at the relativist and saying uh, that you can't deny the, the realism of something, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, realism is the only way to go. Relativism has a lot of value in it specifically in the social sciences, right? Now, can we use methods from the physical sciences in the social sciences? Uh, well, you know, the, the convenient answer is that it depends, right? Of course, you can use them, but it depends. It depends on the topic of your inquiry, what it is uh, that you are inquiring into, and also what are your own preferences. So if your preferences is towards hard science, you only believe in, in the experimental method or the survey method, then you're not going to be using any other uh, methodology, right? But if your lineage is towards the softer methodologies, then of course you're going to use that. So we're, we're saying that, you know, we can borrow some of the methods that exist in the natural sciences and we can use them in the uh, social sciences. Specifically, um, the main method would be um, that we're talking about is the experimental method, right? So that can be used in the social sciences, but it depends upon whether our research question is looking for that cause and effect type of a thing, and whether we have a lineage towards using of the experiment. Right? Now, here's another example. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about social classes, right? And this got started with uh, Marx, right? There's the uh, you know, the lower class, the middle class, the upper class, and so forth. Uh, there's also this idea of discrimination and racism and so forth, right? So these are real constructs. These are real ideas, right? Whether we believe in a social class or not is, uh, is, is a different question. Uh, but the social classes do exist. Whether we believe in discrimination or whether we have experiences uh, discrimination or not is, is irrelevant. Its existence cannot be denied, right? So they they uh, they exist. We may disagree, however, on how to conceptualize a class, right? For example, uh, you and I may debate on, on this, and we may uh, disagree on what does it mean uh, when we say lower class versus when does the lower class finish and the middle class begin, or versus when does the middle class finish and the upper class begin, right? But that's that's a complete uh, different struggle. But the reality is that, you know, the, these ideas exist and they are experienced differently by people, right? And that would be a relativist stance about this. For example, the, the, the social classes exist, right? So, where we live and what type of a culture we belong to, that's going to define the experience that we have in that social class. So not all the people in a lower class are going to have the same experience. Not all the people in the middle class are going to have the same experience. Other people will have much different experiences, right? Uh, and that's the relativist view. And the nominalists would say that, well, you know, let's forget about our experiences and so forth. Um, the label that are assigned to us, that label is going to define the, the type of, uh, for example, the privilege that we will experience uh, or the uh, lack thereof. For example, if, if you are uh, labeling yourself as a, as a Pashtun, and you're saying that you are, you know, this elite class that exists in society, uh, and you're not a minority, then suddenly there's a lot of privilege that comes along with that label, and you get to experience that privilege when you're leading your life, right? So that's the nominalist viewpoint. So I'll conclude this lecture with this little uh, table that I have here. Uh, the topmost labels are ontology, realism, 
internal realism, relativism, and norm analysis. And then the two feature uh, constructs that we are concerned about here under ontology is the idea of truth and fact. So truth uh, in realism is that there is a single truth. The fact is that facts exist and can be revealed, right? So realists would believe that there is a single truth and we can find the facts about them uh, through different types of mechanisms. The internal realism believes that truth exists, but it is obscure and facts are con concrete, but they cannot be directly accessed. The relativists believe that there is not a single truth, rather there are multiple truths, and the facts depend on a person's point of view. And the nominalists believe that there is no truth and that facts are all human creation. Right? So this is where I'll conclude this first lecture on research philosophy. And I'm providing you with some readings in our Google Classroom where you can uh, read more closely about the ideas that I have briefly discussed in this lecture. Thank you so very much.